Hello, this is Nick Freitas, and welcome back to Making the Argument. Uh, for today's show, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over some of the things that are, are trending in the news or some of the things that are conveniently not trending in the news. And we're going to break down what's going on, what are some of the arguments being made, how do we respond to it. You know, we're going we're to filter through kind of the media narrative on some of these things and uh, hopefully provide a, a good perspective on, on some of the key issues uh, that, that are showing up right now or, or, or popped up either in the news or social media this last week. So let, let's go with the one that's obviously been trending, and that is uh, the the fall from glory of Governor Andrew Cuomo. Um, I mean, got anybody that was watching over the summer, uh, the media or the coverage of Andrew Cuomo, you would have thought he was the second coming. I mean, this, this was the guy that was going to cure everything. And oh my gosh, wasn't he so brilliant in his administration and, and running New York and dealing with COVID. And my gosh, he's just so dreamy, right? Like it was, it was just this love affair with the media of Governor Cuomo. And that's not just his brother. I mean, that, that was everybody. The guy won an Emmy for the, for the, the, conferences that he was doing and the videos that he, his, his government was putting out on how to address um, COVID. I mean, he won an Emmy for it. I mean, this, this was just, and, and you can tell some of this was the, the left really trying to push this contrast with President Trump versus Governor Cuomo. And, and I think so many of us were frustrated because as we're looking at this, I, I think New York ranked second, I mean, just behind New Jersey ranked second in the number of COVID cases versus, versus deaths, actual deaths from COVID. And now all of a sudden, this is the guy that, that we're all supposed to follow. I mean, they, they hated Donald Trump. They also hated Governor Ron DeSantis. Now, comparatively, Florida, which has had a, a much more lenient policy with respect to lockdowns, uh, Florida has largely been open for business in a way that New York hasn't even dreamed of. Um, you know, they, they're, I think, ranked somewhere in the middle of the country, somewhere in the middle of the country with respect to number of COVID cases versus number of deaths, but their, their economy, their schools, you know, all these things have, have not suffered the, the same consequences that these incredibly strict lockdown states have, right? And, and again, even when we're counting COVID deaths, which is serious and which we should do and which we should be very accurate uh, when we're doing that, there, there's also deaths associated with the policies that state governments have, have implemented as well. I mean, we, we've seen upticks with respect to substance abuse, with respect to suicides, a lot of these other things that, that you know, are, are second and third order effects or potential unintended consequences of these more draconian lockdown policies, not to mention the fact businesses going out of business, people losing their jobs, um, not being able to pay their rent. I mean, any number of things, right? So you have, you have Ron DeSantis who didn't do a lot of the more draconian measures and all the press was essentially saying that Florida was gonna be this wasteland because because also when you when you look at the percentage of um, you know senior citizens within a particular state, Florida has a, a huge population of senior citizens, and so you would you would naturally expect when you have something like COVID that disproportionately affects people who have potentially compromised immune systems, um, or, you know, or, or you know, typically more elderly, you you would naturally expect their numbers to be higher. But again, if if you look at the number of COVID cases versus the number of COVID deaths. Florida ranks somewhere in the, in the middle of the country, somewhere in the you know, mid-20s. New York is second. But again, throw all of that out because as far as the press was concerned, Governor Cuomo was the guy that was going to do it. He even wrote a book called American Crisis, Leadership Lessons from the COVID-19 Pandemic. And I think what all of us are dying to know at this point is, is two questions about, about his book specifically. One, is he going to use the royalties from the book in order to fund his defense? Because he's probably going to end up in court for, for what they did. And then two, is, is there going to be any sort of a addition, any sort of update to the book that points out the fact that a, a, according to, and this isn't some you know, right-wing conspiracy theory, according to Melissa De Rosa, the secretary to the governor, right on a conference call that she had with Democrat lawmakers up in New York, she said they were specifically concerned that the data with respect to nursing home COVID-related deaths would be used against them by the Department of Justice. So what, what, is, what exactly does that mean? Well, the way that New York, and, and apparently this was under the full knowledge of, of Governor Cuomo and his team, the way that New York was tracking nursing home-related deaths is they were covering up. So if, if you got COVID at a nursing home, but then you went to the hospital, they didn't list it as a nursing home related COVID death, they just listed it as a COVID death within the hospitals. And, and how much did they do this? Well, it looks like about 40% 
40% of nursing home related deaths, all right, got reported as, as hospital deaths, hospital COVID deaths. They didn't make the association between, uh, uh, with the nursing home. And so the end result is that this equals out to be, oh gosh, I think it was 15,000, over 15,000 COVID related deaths to nursing homes. They only reported somewhere over 9,000, right? So, I mean, just again, a 40% difference between what actually happened and what New York State reported to the federal government. And, and again, Cuomo is now coming out and, and his famous quote from one of his press conferences, well, everybody was just really overworked. And, and yeah, you know, that, that was a problem, but everyone was just really overworked and, and that's what happened. Um, okay, well, not according to, again, Melissa De Rosa. So one of us isn't telling the truth. And, and something tells me that Governor Cuomo in a, in a press conference might not be as open about what was actually going on as his secretary on a private call with Democrat lawmakers. Right? So she makes it sound as if they, they knew there was a connection there between nursing home related COVID deaths and the numbers they were reporting. And they deliberately didn't report some of them, a significant amount, again, almost 40% because they were afraid that it could be used against them if they went past a certain threshold. Now, it, it, it's not that the media isn't reporting on this at all, but, but it is fascinating to me that, that some of the biggest names in media over at MSNBC or CNN, this is not leading their, their, their primetime news shows. Now, I, I want you to replace the name Cuomo with DeSantis, all right? Or replace the name Cuomo with Trump. Does anybody think CNN or MSNBC wouldn't be leading with this every day, all day? They'd have experts coming in talking about the, the, the catastrophic mistake this was, the absolute horrible mishandling, the potential legal charges that should be brought against them, impeachment charges that should be Of course they would. We know they would. This is not a question of, gosh, do you think they would do this? Or if the shoe was on the other foot, would they be intellectually honest and consistent with, with respect to how they were reporting this? No, we already know they wouldn't be. Because of, because of how they behaved with, with Governor DeSantis, because of how they behaved with Governor Kristi Noem, because of how they behaved with the Trump administration. And, and again, this, this goes back to the, the, the bigger problem here. The bigger issue here is what is the standard? Right, because I, I've been sitting in the Virginia House of Delegates listening to Democrats talk about, I, one Democrat literally said that, that Donald Trump was the equivalent of a war criminal because he had, he had, made, he, he had made a statement where he had, he had said, it, he had talked about downplaying the, the overall crisis or downplaying um, uh, the, the you know, seriousness of it, right? And, and again, I think this was reported by Bob Woodward. And, and so she, she said that that makes him the equivalent of a war criminal because Donald Trump said he's essentially a wartime president during COVID, and so he's a war criminal, and she wants to know how that's going to be dealt with. Okay, great. If that's the standard, if that's the standard, then what should happen to, to Governor Cuomo out of curiosity? And, and, you know, so many in the press get, get so bent out of shape about being called fake news or this idea that, you know, conspiracy theories just, just go off the deep end and go viral with Republican audiences or with conservative audiences. Well, again, if, if the press is mad about this, allow me to make a recommendation. Uh, go find a mirror and look in it. No, like seriously, stare very deeply into it. Because one of the reasons why you, you don't like some of the, the information or what they might determine as, or they might uh, categorize as misinformation, goes out there and becomes viral on social media, it's because the, the institutions that we're supposed to trust to be able to fairly apply a standard and, and at least provide some sort of consistency, not only do they fail to do so, it, it's not incompetence, right? It's not incompetence at this point, it is deliberate. And the moment people lose faith in the media's ability to, to be able to provide you know, some measure of consistency, it doesn't have to be perfect, Right, I think we all expect that there's going to be some sort of bias. You know, nobody's completely free of bias. We get it. All right, but but this is ridiculous. I mean, at this point, you're you're just a talking head for a particular political party or for certain people in power, and and for the press to sit there and arrogantly, you know, hold themselves up as the defenders of, of not just democracy but of truth and of hardcore analysis and science. Okay, if that's what you want, that comes with certain obligations. Right, what, what Governor Cuomo, what more and more was coming about what Governor Cuomo did or what he failed to do or what his governor, government apparently deliberately covered up, all right, it is not just, I mean, obviously, potentially fraud and potentially criminal, 
but certainly it rises to the level of, of malfeasance or, or just government mismanagement that deserves the media's attention, right? Not just, not just a couple articles here and there or not allowing a, a guest host to write a, an editorial at the Washington Post or the New York Times, but like really stringent analysis of what did you know? When did you know it? What did you do? What did you, or what did you fail to do? Right, so I, I mean, again, at this point, if, if the mainstream media wants to know why so many people fail to trust them, and as a result, go to other sources of information, some of which I think are very good, and some of which I, I think are skeptical, or, or I'm skeptical of, well, this is why. You're, you're part of the problem. Because this should have been something where the press should have been all over the Cuomo administration. And, and the same people that, the same people in the press, whether it's, it's Don Lemon or, or you know, Rachel Maddow, she, she's more of an editorialist. She doesn't pretend to be an objective journalist, but, but Don Lemon still pretends. All right, well, great. Here's your opportunity to prove, because you've been telling us for months that, that you know, COVID is a huge crisis. And, and I agree, it is. It is a, it is a huge crisis. It's, it's one of the most monumental things this country has faced in, in the, the last several decades. So, so please explain to us right, why this is not leading the news, why the press is not asking serious, hard questions repeatedly of the Cuomo administration. Why are they letting him get away with what he's currently doing, which is just obfuscation or, or, or complete, um, just a, a two-step from what they were saying a couple of months ago. So I, I, I think people have a right to expect that. And, and this, is the, uh, this is an opportunity. This is the opportunity for the press to step up on something that should be fairly easy for them to do based off of everything they've been reporting months previous. And, and if they're not willing to do it at this point, well then my gosh, do not be surprised when people do not take you seriously as an objective journalist, right? And, and again, look, if, if you wanna look at mismanagement by other politicians of different political parties, of the Republicans, fine, you, you've done that, right? You, you've done that <laughs> almost exclusively at this point. Here's an opportunity to actually prove that, that there is an objective standard to which any administration, regardless of what political party they are, regardless if they've won an Emmy, regardless if they have a best-selling book, right? please tell me that there's a standard that they can all be measured to equally. And, and if they fail to meet that standard, or, or if they engage in the sort of behavior and activities that the Cuomo administration apparently has at this point, then you have an obligation to, impo to enforce that standard. But, but right now, it doesn't look like the press is willing to do it, all right? So again, that, that's what's going on with Cuomo right now. We'll, we'll you know, continue to follow up on that and, and see what ends up transpiring as a result. Um, but the love affair with Cuomo, you would think at this point, should, should at least come to an end. But I don't know, no, no signs of that. We'll, we'll see at some point if they decide that they're just going to throw him overboard. Uh, because they've, they've got to realize at this point that this, this is just so obvious um, that not even they can ignore it. And, and they, they need to actually step forward and do their job as journalists and accurately report this because, um, you know, again, it, the, the policy that Cuomo implemented in New York, specifically with nursing homes, um, ha, has been called into question for some time. He tried to blame the federal government. He tried to blame the CDC. Uh, then he wrote a book about how great he handled it regardless of everybody else's failures. And now we're finding out that, again, by, by all appearances, it looks like they deliberately hid the numbers and because they were afraid of the DOJ potentially investigating them. All right, just, just so everyone's clear, government officials are not allowed to hide numbers because you're afraid you might be held to account. You're not allowed to do that. So press... Have at it. Step forward. Do your job. We're all waiting to see it. It'll be fun to watch. All right. Let's move on to the next, um, next topic we want to talk about here and, and cancel culture, right? Everybody's favorite topic right now, cancel culture and what happened with uh, Gina Carano from uh, The Mandalorian. First of all, if you've never seen The Mandalorian, um, I, I actually love it. I think, I think it's a great show. Um, there, there's the, you know, we, we always joke, you know, you see this thing in popular culture, we have like Star Trek families and Star Wars family. We are a Star Wars family. Um, and we've been really disappointed with a lot of the, the sequels that have come out and, and the prequels and everything else. But Mandalorian was actually a, a pretty good series. It was entertaining, it was fun to watch. And, and Gina's character was one of, quite frankly, one of the best characters on the show. And for those of you who don't know Gina, she was a former MMA fighter, um, but one of the largest sins Gina has committed is, is being a conservative and, and being a fairly outspoken conservative. All right now, the, the left will come back and say that's ridiculous, that's absurd, she wasn't fired for that, she was fired for these horrendous social media posts. So let, let's talk about the social media posts that, that she put out. 
all right? And, and I'm gonna go ahead and read it verbatim here so I don't get it wrong. It was basically, it was a picture of, of a woman that was, you know, fleeing um, people that were, uh, you know, accosting her and abusing her. And it's, and the quote said, Jews were beaten in the streets, not by Nazi soldiers, but by their neighbors, even by children. Because history is edited, most people today don't realize to get to the point where Nazi soldiers could easily round up thousands of Jews, the government first made their own neighbors hate them simply for being Jews. How is that any different from hating someone for their political views? Right, that was the quote on the, the picture that she tweeted out. And this, this was you know, the, the primary reasoning that Disney gave for firing her. Uh, all right, let, let's look at this honestly and objectively. Personally, I'm not a fan of, of people making loose comparisons to the Holocaust. Um, the Holocaust was obviously one of, one of the most egregious events that took place within the 20th century, obvi or, or arguably within world history. The idea that an entire people group would be systematically rounded up as a result because of their race and, and executed, it is absolutely morally abhorrent. And anyone that, that talks about the Holocaust should do so with a certain degree of respect or, and reverence for what happened around, the circumstances around that, what actually happened, a reverence for the survivors and a reverence for the people that endured that, that brutal oppression and mass murder, right? So I, I, I always think we should be very, very careful whenever we're making those sorts of comparisons. Um, Having said that, I've been told by members on the left, when, when they're making loose comparisons to everything from fascism to Nazism, even when they're making references to the Holocaust, in fact, her, her co-star made a reference to the Holocaust comparing you know, uh, Jewish concentration camps in World War II to ICE facilities within the United States. Right? He, he made that comparison. I, I didn't see a great deal of outrage from the left when he made that kind of comparison. And we're going to talk a little bit about what, what's been uncovered at some ICE facilities here in a little bit. But again, what is the standard, <laughs> right? If, if the standard is, is that you're not allowed to make any sort of association with the Holocaust or any of these sort of events or the social conditioning that a government actively conducted in order to lead up to something like the Holocaust, if you're not allowed to mention any of that unless it's in, in perfect context, well then, I'm sorry, there's a lot of people on the left that are going to have to delete their Twitter accounts. Because they do it frequently. And the argument that they use whenever they make those sort of comparisons is essentially to say that, look, it never, it, it's not as if one day Germany woke up, Hitler was in charge, said, let's round up all of the Jewish people, and the German people just said, okay, sounds great. It's not like that happened, right? The argument that they make is that it was a steady, uh, a steady, deliberate, uh, method of, of social engineering, of, of propagandizing, um, uh, of talking about people and creating a narrative where they were subhuman. And by doing that in, in academia, by doing that with official government policy, by doing that within propaganda in the news media, by doing that within arts and entertainment, they created a narrative and they desensitized people to that sort of behavior. And, and so there was a, there, again, there was a long-term plan of social engineering before they got to the point where the Nazis could actually get away with, with in, engaging in, again, one of the most egregious acts in human history, right? Again, that is the argument the left uses when they're constantly bringing up or making comparisons to Nazis or fascism or the Holocaust is, the, is they're making that point. And guess what? There is validity to that point. There is validity to that point. In fact, it, I would really encourage you to read Viktor Frankl, who, who's, I mean, incredible life story. This is a man who, he's a psychiatrist. He's considered, um, you know, on par with, with thinkers like Freud when it comes to uh, psychiatry and, and understanding uh, psychology and human behavior and, and how people react to, to various events and the various things that influence their actions. Viktor Frankl actually was in the Nazi death camps. He didn't have to be, though. If you read his story, it, it's just incredibly moving and, and, again, heartbreaking. This was someone that had an opportunity to actually flee the country in time, chose to stay because his family couldn't leave with him, and went through the horrors of the Holocaust, witnessed it firsthand, and wrote a great deal about his experiences. 
Um, and he even talks about how the, the idea for the Holocaust or, or the conditions which were necessary in order to carry out the Holocaust w was not something that was just created overnight in some sort of you know, government agency. It was something that people were prepared to accept within Germany over years. All right? so, so warning against that sort of behavior, warning against those sort of trends is not invalid, right? It's a necessary component of the conversation. Should you always do so in a respectful manner and in an intellectually honest and consistent manner so that we're not you know, throwing out extreme examples um, that, that can be potentially you know, offensive to people that went through that? And, and you know, should, we make, should we make sure that when we make those comparisons, they're, they're appropriate and they're not just politically convenient? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but again, what she said, if, if you have an issue with what she said, or if you have an issue with the comparison with what she said, I, I can understand that. And if someone came forward and said, look, this is why I don't think this is a, a fair comparison, I, I would be willing to sit down and, and, and analyze that argument and, and perhaps even agree with it. But the idea that you're going to fire her or, or suggest that she's anti-Semitic, that was the other thing I didn't understand, was this whole idea that, well, no, Gina Carano is anti-Semitic because she made that remark. No, she isn't. At, at what point... In what I read off, or in the meme that she put out, did, did she say anything that was in any way supportive of the Holocaust? In, in any way, you know, reducing the horror of it? I mean, you, you could make the argument, I guess, that um, since the comparison wasn't a, a, or if you believe it wasn't a fair comparison, you could make the argument that it was minimizing it. But I certainly don't think that was her intention, and there's nothing else that I can see within her Twitter history or social media history or public comments that would ever suggest that she's anti-Semitic. And, and again, if that's the standard of anti-Semitism, um, I know a couple Democrat congresswomen that are, should probably be impeached here pretty soon. Again, if, if that's your standard, well, then Disney has some explaining to do because, again, A, her co-star made, made a similar reference to Nazi death camps, com again, comparing them to ICE facilities within the United States, not to mention the fact that, it, I'm sorry, is this the same Disney that filmed Mulan on site in China in the same region where the Chinese government it is, is holding Muslims in concentration camps? And then thanked the government of and thanked the government of China and the regional government for all of their cooperation as they filmed Mulan. Is, is this the same Disney? Is, is, would Disney like to cancel itself at, at this point in order to remain intellectually consistent? Uh, again, if, if you're if you're on the left and you're sitting here looking at all of this and you don't understand why it is the conservatives are upset about Gina getting fired. Might I offer it, it, the frustration is that the complete and total lack of consistency. Now, let me say this. Disney had every right to fire her. Every right. You, you will never see me advocating for a law which tells a business they're not allowed to fire someone if, if they no longer feel that either their work is sufficient to justify you know, them staying on board or if they decide that you know, they just you know, don't like it. I mean, again, they, they have the ability to do that. I'm, I'm not taking away... Um, you know, the, their right as a business to decide that this person no longer represents the, the values of, of their business and wants to fire them for, for something like this, right? All right? There's some things you can fire people for, but this is something you can fire someone for. And especially when you have a business which is really focused on a, on a public image, um, then yeah, what someone says on social media can potentially affect that image, can pinch, uh, potentially affect the business. And so they have a right to fire you. I am not questioning Disney's right to fire someone. What I'm questioning is, once again, the complete and total double standard. So, again, that, that's the part where people look at this and go, no, you didn't fire her because you really believe she's an anti-Semite. You, you didn't fire her because she's the only person at Disney putting out and, you know, crazy things on, on Twitter or social media. You fired her because she's a conservative. Because the tweets that she's put out are relatively mild. I mean, again, comparatively speaking. If you look at what some other Disney writers and, and employees have put out on their Twitter page, right, this is relatively mild, mild in comparison. So again, the, why, why are so many conservatives upset about this? Or, I'll explain why I am. It's not because you fired her. You have a right to do that. It's the reasons that you gave. Because I, I have absolutely zero faith that you are going to consistently apply those reasons across the board within the company.
You're just not going to do it. I know you're not going to do it because you haven't done it and because you are, you are more than willing to ignore atrocities in places that you want to do business with, as is evidenced by you know, Disney's catering to the communist Chinese government. All right, so great. You want to display some intellectual consistency? I'll have a little bit more respect. But in the meantime, as a customer, yeah, I'm, I'm going to think very differently about my Disney Plus account. But the, the good news is, and, and Gina said this, and she's, she's going to go actually do a movie with Daily Wire, with Ben Shapiro. Um, you know, they, they put out their first movie a while back, Run, Hide, Fight. I actually went and saw it. I'm a, I'm a Daily Wire subscriber. I thought it was incredibly well done. Um, and it achieved what, what Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, and all of them have been talking about, which is to say, look, we're going to provide an alternative with entertainment. And they're not looking to necessarily make conservative movies. They're looking to make good movies that don't constantly insult you. And they're not going to cancel everyone the moment someone says something that they potentially disagree with. And so what, what Gina said, what Ben has said is like, look, you, you can only be truly canceled if there is no alternative and if you allow them to cancel you. So now there's another mechanism for her to continue her movie career. From what I understand, she's going to produce and star in a movie, um, you know, again, sponsored by Daily Wire. If you're looking for, if you're looking for a way, if you're mad about this, like for whatever reason, maybe you're mad about the inconsistency, maybe you're just mad because you think Disney is insulting your values or, you know, they're, they're applying a double standard. If you're mad about that, there's, there's a couple different things you can do. You can get on social media and you can rant about it. I mean, I'm clearly ranting about it right now. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with that. Or you, you can, in addition to that, <laughs> you can also go to those networks or you can go to those alternatives that are starting to spring up that say, look, we're not going to cancel someone over something like this. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not going to, we're not going to pretend everyone's perfect. And if somebody does go beyond the pale, because there was one person working for Disney that had a bunch of tweets that was essentially making light of rape and pedophilia. And that guy got fired and that good, right? But there are things that are beyond the pale. And then there are things that might be uncomfortable. There's things that you can even say are insensitive, but, but don't necessarily rise to the level of, of firing someone over, especially when, when you're not applying the standard equally across your company. So as someone that, if you're frustrated by this, the most democratic thing you do is not voting about something. The most democratic thing you do is voting with your feet, your time, and your money. And now you have an ability. If you, if you want to continue to see her acting career flourish, great. You have an ability to go sign up, be a subscriber with Daily Wire, and you can continue to watch her. And I will encourage you to do so. That's what, that's what I'm going to do. Right? So I'm, I'm not just going to talk about it. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, and I'm going to respect an organization that is providing her an opportunity to continue to act because I do think she's a, a talented actress. And I, I, again, I think she contributed a lot to the Mandalorian series, and I, I look forward to seeing what she's going to do next. All right, last thing I want to discuss today is Texas. So in anybody that's, that's lived in a, in a colder climate and I'm not going to suggest, you know, when I was in the military, you know, the farthest north I, I lived was, was Washington State. And, yeah, it would snow there, but where I lived in Washington, it really wasn't that bad. Uh, but I got a lot of friends that are from, you know, New York or, or Maine, and they love to tease me because anytime we get, you know, four inches of snow in Virginia, it, it's, you know, people don't know how to drive, and, and, it's, and it's nuts, and your power goes out on the whole deal, whereas up there, you know, and, uh, four inches of snow is a light flurry. All right, but obviously Texas is one of those places that isn't associated or isn't used to or <laughs> getting a, a huge cold front like what's moved in right now, and it has had devastating effects within the power grid. And this has caused both sides to run forward and, and offer a particular solution. One side says, you know, this is all you know, green energy's fault, and you've got all these wind turbines that have frozen, and you know, Texas was recently bragging about having over 20% of its total power source supplied by wind turbines, and now with the frost, you know, that, that's creating a huge problem. The left is coming out and saying, that's ridiculous. How could you, you know, blame green energy when you have, uh, you know, you have other you know, fossil fuel plants or nuclear plants that have also shut down as a result of the winter weather or unanticipated winter weather or winter weather that Texas is not used to. And so they're, they're basically accusing us of putting it all in green energy when you could just as easily point to some of the other you know, traditional methods of providing power from fossil fuels, whether it be natural gas um, or even advanced methods like um, nuclear energy. 
And so I looked at this because, you know, I, I know what my predisposition, predisposition is. I, I don't have anything against green energy, but I've been, I've had a real problem with the way that governments have attempted to subsidize and manipulate the market in favor of certain types of renewable energy that I don't think are anywhere near close enough to be able to produce the sort of output necessary to make sure that we have a, a reliable grid system, right? So my, my attitude has always been green energy, great, renewable energy, wonderful, allow it to develop within the marketplace, within a competitive marketplace, so that it can, it, so that it can develop appropriately. Because when, once, you, once you tell a green energy company or once you tell a green energy investor that, hey, you don't have to actually meet market demands because we're going to basically fleece taxpayers in order to give you a bunch of subsidies, you know, not only is that wrong because of what you're doing to the taxpayers, not only is that wrong when you increase someone's energy bill because you require the state-owned monopoly to engage in, in green energy sources which don't provide the same output, but it's also wrong from a research and development perspective because if you're, if you're telling companies that the government will now decide what the standards are in order to get your subsidy, well, now your research and development isn't geared toward making the best product possible based on consumer demand. It's just based on getting the best lobbyists in order to continue your subsidies. And I think it actually perverts the research and development process for green energy. So if you want green energy, my argument has been, great, go within the marketplace and, and allow those factors in order to ensure that it's going to develop and it's going to progress and it's going to evolve in a way that actually makes it sustainable within the marketplace and a genuine alternative to fossil fuels. Don't do it in such a way to where it's just political manipulation and whoever has the best lobbyists wins, right? So... I, I really try to look at this fairly in Texas, and, and here's the conclusion I've come to. You've seen some stuff on social media where it shows helicopters, and it's said that these helicopters are in Texas dropping, you know, different fuels on the wind turbines in order to get them to operate again. From what, I, from what I've seen, that's not accurate. Yes, there are helicopters that are, are going down there and, and I guess dropping hot water on the blades to try to get them moving again uh, because the power output went down to, I mean, it was significantly cut as a result of wind turbines being frozen. But the picture that was used, I guess, was of, of a helicopter in a Nordic country um, and, and again, I don't like stuff like that, right? I don't like rushes to judgment. I don't like it when someone throws together a pithy meme and the next thing you know, uh, that's a substitute for an argument. I don't like it when the left does it. I don't like it when the right does it, right? So when I saw that, I, I found that frustrating because I think it actually sets our, our narrative, our argument back. By the same token, <laughs> um, it is absolutely true that the government of Texas, just like the government of California, just like the government now here in Virginia, started to demand of its, again, state monopolized energy companies that they start investing more into green energy and renewable energy, right? And, and some of this they covered with additional taxes or additional, uh, or the rates they would allow the ener energy company to charge us. So again, it was, it was a tax on your energy bill, essentially, in order to prioritize more green energy or more renewable energy. One of the, the best arguments that, I, that I've heard with this goes to the idea that, yes, it is true that there were fossil fuels-based uh, you know, power plants and whatnot that were also shut down. Yes, it is true that there was a nuclear plant that was also shut down. So you, you can't blame what's currently going on with the grid in Texas right now exclusively on you know, green energy or, or windmills freezing up. You can't exclusively blame that. It would be intellectually dishonest to do so. However... It is also valid to point out that when you tell the energy company that you have to start allocating resources toward green energy, those resources have to come from somewhere. And they are not, at least right now it looks like in Texas, that, that was not exclusively made up for by increased rates. Because obviously nobody likes to, to pass legislation which is going to drastically increase rates to meet all of the, these new government mandates. So what ends up happening is the company whether it was you know, PG&E in, in California or, or the companies in Texas, they start moving resources from grid resiliency of, of their fossil fuel-based plants over to renewables. And, and we know this happened in California. We know that one of the reasons why we had huge problems and, and a, a source of the wildfires out there was not just because PG&E was being lazy with respect to its power lines. It's because the state government, the politicians that were all very green energy friendly, told them, don't spend money over here, you need to spend it on this. You need to meet these goals. And if you don't meet those goals, you're going to be in trouble. So what did they do? They allocated resources away from power line maintenance over to meeting green energy goals, right? I, I suspect the same thing happened in Texas. 
So, so now the money and the resources that might have otherwise gone to greater grid resiliency, because one of the biggest problems with renewable energy is that if, if the renewable energy is not allowed to consistently you know, pump out the energy, th there's no real storage for it. I mean, they're, they're talking about spending billions of dollars on, on trying to construct batteries to store th this, this energy so that when you do have a, a major you know, inclement weather situation like this, there, there's still some sort of storage for the power that you've already generated so that you can use it when the windmill can't turn or when the sun's not out. The problem is, is that technology is horribly expensive and horribly inefficient compared to oil in a barrel, right, or, or, or natural gas sitting in a storage facility, right? That, that can be stored up and used at a later date, but it's very difficult to do that with, with solar power, with wind power. It just is. It, it is not economically efficient to do so. And there's enormous costs associated with it. But if your state governments are going to continue to tell, again, against you know, monopolized uh, power companies that that's where they have to spend their resources, well then don't be surprised when the grid is not as resilient as it otherwise would be. Now, you, you can make the argument that because this sort of weather doesn't happen in Texas generally, that even if they had that additional resources, they wouldn't have spent it on resiliency. Again, one of the things I'm waiting to see is how was money being allocated before all of these government mandates toward green energy, and how was it being allocated after the government mandates? And, and is there a reasonable argument to be made that had we not put all this focus on wind, then more money could have gone in preparing for this sort of situation? Right? Again, remains to be seen. I'm, I'm not rendering judgment right now. But I am saying that we know in other places that that is exactly what has happened. We know that happened in California, and it had dire consequences. And again, it begs the question, if you really care about the environment, well, when something like this happens, when the grid goes down and people are hurt by it, or in California where it results in a massive wildfire that sets an entire town on fire, do, do you think that there was more emissions released into the atmosphere because there wasn't enough green energy in California or because an entire town went up in flames as a, re it was as a result, in part, of bad energy policy. Now, there's a good website that you can go to if you want to get some, some data on this. The, the left doesn't like it. They're going to say it's biased. And, and it is. The guy is biased in favor of fossil fuels. But the reason why I think he's biased in favor of fossil fuels is because I actually think he does some pretty good analysis. Uh, but it's called energytalkingpoints.com, and they just released an article specifically talking about what happened in Texas. And I, I think it's actually a, a pretty fair overview. Um, again, he's not sitting there and blaming everything on, on renewable energy or, or wind turbines. He's just simply making, I, I think, a pretty coherent argument for why this, this government um, you know, drive to push things to renewables creates problems and, and that the technology is not there yet to actually ensure that you have grid resiliency when you have a major event like this, right? So again, just like we've seen in other states that are really pushing this, but, but not actually allocating the necessary resources to make sure that the grid is resilient, that existing power lines are secure. Um, you know, again, it, my position on this has always been all hands on deck with respect to energy. Right? I, I have no problem with renewables. I have no problem with green energy. I do have a problem with the government manipulating the process in favor of technology, which is clearly not at a stage that it can provide the sort of resiliency we expect to see, especially when you have a major weather event like this in a place that's not used to getting it, and now all of a sudden people are without power, they're without water as a result. So. Uh, energytalkingpoints.com, I think is, a, again, a good place to go. Judge for yourself. Judge for yourself whether or not you think the analysis that the guy goes through is good. Um, also, re read, read the perspectives from the other side. I've, I've, <laughs> again, you Google search this, and you're going to get 10 articles about how stupid conservatives are uh, for, for believing that renewable energy or, or wind turbines are responsible for um, you know, the, the breakdown in the grid in Texas before you get to one article talking about the counter perspective. All right, but again, I, I believe in looking at both and, and let's come to a rational conclusion. All right, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Um, once again, thank, thank you for joining us. Uh, if, you know, if, if you like this content, we've had a couple people, I, I try to interact on our YouTube channel and our Facebook when we put these out, when people have questions or they wanna talk a little bit more about a particular topic. Um, if, if you do have those questions, Please put them in the comments section, like and share. If you, if you were wondering what the currency is of podcasts, it's, it's actually taking the time. It's when listeners take the time to just go onto your app on your phone. It says write a review, put on a five-star review, 
you know, write a couple comments for us or, or maybe ask us a question. I go through and I check those uh, because it does influence what we do for future podcasts. We want to make sure that we're actually, again, making an argument for the things that you are concerned about. And so please, if you got some time, go on that app, five-star review, write us a quick review. And um, again, thank you very much for, for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next time.